thrusts, just like any other fault, can show variations in their displacement. And displacement distance diagrams are useful ways for illustrating and analysing these variations. Let's look at this uh, seismic interpretation from offshore Nigeria. And it shows a thrust climbing from deep intersection and offsetting a green layer, then an orange layer, but not offsetting the blue layer. So in other words, the fault dies out upwards at a tip and the blue layer beyond is folded into a tip line fold. So displacement distance diagrams are a way of analysing these variations. We can look at the ways in which the patterns of displacement vary approaching the tips of thrust faults. And we'll use these diagrams to look at the implications of these displacement variations for the strains in the wall rocks to the fault. We'll look at a way of forecasting the position of fault tips. And then we'll consider ways of investigating the mechanical stratigraphy, in other words, the rheological behaviour of the wall rocks. These approaches were set up in 1983 by this paper by Graham Williams and Tim Chapman. So we'll be following in their footsteps. So let's look at this situation here, where we've got an array of units and a fault running along like this. So we can consider this to be a cross section and the fault has died out towards the left at a tip. So let's put some displacement into this diagram. So we pushed our model in from the right. We've got slip on the right hand side, but no slip on the left. This means that the amount of slip decreases towards the fault tip. And as a consequence, the rocks above the fault have become deformed. There's strain in the wall rocks. So let's plot up the relationships between displacement and distance from the tip. We'll just work through how we do this. So that's the distance from the tip to the right hand side of the hanging wall marked by the green bar. And the displacement of that marker is that much there because originally it all lined up on the right hand side of the model. So we can plot these two values on our graph. The distance and the displacement and plot it as a point on the graph. And we can do the same for various other points across our model. So here are various points in the hanging wall to our fault and they've all been offset and we can plot them onto the graph like this. So we can see there's a relationship here and at close distances to the tip there's very low displacement, for example here. So this diagram shows the decrease in slip towards the tip of the thrust. And it's a linear relationship and this is because the strain above the fault plane in the hanging wall is homogeneous. Well, let's do this again, but change the gradient of displacement along the fault plane and consequently the strain in the hanging wall. Here's our original setup. Let's move on the fault. You'll notice that our elliptical markers are not so elliptical as they were in the first case. So we can plot up our markers again, starting with the right hand side of the model, the distance measured in the hanging wall from the tip back to the right hand side is as shown there, and the displacement is rather less than we had last time. Consequently, it plots in this position on the graph. And we can do the same for the intermediate markers, like this, and link them all up into a relationship. Okay, so let's just get rid of the points. Here's our linear relationship between distance and displacement along this fault. Well, let's compare the gradient of this line with the model that we generated earlier. Here's that earlier gradient, and it's steeper. And that's because the strain in the wall rocks in that first model was higher. Let's just remind ourselves of it here. So the gradient of the line 
on our displacement distance diagram relates to the strain that is able to be accommodated in the hanging wall to the fault. The higher the strain, the steeper the gradient. So we've looked at how displacement variations on thrust faults can generate wall rot strains. Now let's look at a way of forecasting the position of the thrust tip. And we can set this up with this diagram here, which shows a deformed package of rocks, an orange layer sitting on top of a yellow layer. And they're cut by a thrust fault, but we don't know where it terminates towards the right. Well, let's use the analysis that was proposed by Williams and Chapman. We'll set up a reference point on the fault plane. And this is arbitrary. It doesn't matter where we set this up, but it will give us a place from which we can make measurements. So we set up a displacement distance diagram with our reference point at the origin as shown here. And we'll use this reference point to make our measurements. So we can start off measuring back to the top of the orange layer in the hanging wall and take this onto our displacement distance diagram. And the displacement on the top of the orange is this distance here. So we can now use this value to find it on the plot. So that's where the top of the orange marker lies. Well, now we can do this for another marker. So let's move on now to the base of the yellow. That's its distance from the reference point to where that marker comes down against the fault plane in the hanging wall. There's that distance on the plot. Here's the displacement matching the hanging wall and foot wall. And that's how this plots on the diagram. So we've got two points on our displacement distance diagram. So let's just use these to extrapolate the relationship between distance and displacement. Because we've got two points, it's obviously a straight line. And the tip will be where the displacement is zero. So we just follow our extrapolation across the graph to the place where displacement is zero there. And that tells us that the tip lies that distance beyond R. In other words, here. So this is a pretty neat way of completing cross sections. It does assume, however, that there's a known behavior between displacement and distance, and that this can be extrapolated beyond our known relationships to where the displacement dies out to nothing. But there's another way in which we can use these diagrams. We can use them to investigate mechanical stratigraphy, in other words, the rheological response of wall rocks, how they accumulate strain that is associated with displacement variations on the thrust. So let's go back to this type of diagram here. So far, we've assumed that the strains are homogeneous, in which case displacement distance diagrams generate straight line plots. But let's change the rheology in our model. We're going to have an orange package of rocks quite close to where the fault tip is that can deform easily, two green cells that are unable to deform at all, in other words, they're very strong, and then a more intermediate type of behaviour over on the right-hand side. So let's deform these units. So we can see the response is variable across the hanging wall of the fault plane. Most striking are those two green cells which have not deformed, therefore our original circular markers remain circular after deformation. They've just simply been translated along the fault plane. So, we have variations in strain across the model. High strain wall rocks, unstrained wall rocks, and lower strain wall rocks across our diagram. So let's now move on and plot these relationships up. So here are our markers and how they plot on the displacement distance diagram. And we can join these up like this. And you'll notice it's not a straight line. So let's break this line out into different segments with distinct gradients. The high strain wall rocks are plotting on a steep gradient. The lower strain wall rocks are plotting on a more gentle gradient. And the unstrained wall rocks are plotting on a flat line because they show a constant displacement. 
So the shape of the plot, these variations in gradient, reveal real logical variations, the different abilities of the raw rocks to accumulate strain. This is mechanical stratigraphy. So we've introduced the concept of displacement distance diagrams and looked at two applications. We looked at forecasting the location of the thrust tip. In order to do this, we had to be able to quantify the relationships between displacement and distance for part of the diagram and then assume this relationship remained valid for the unknown part into which we extrapolated. In the second approach, we investigated the mechanical stratigraphy, in other words, the variations in how strain is accommodated in the wall rocks. And we can do this if we know the full structure. In other words, where the fault is and where the markers are in both the hanging wall and foot wall, so we can define their displacements. So in the first example for forecasting the thrust tip location, we're extrapolating from the plot. For the mechanical stratigraphy, we're analysing the gradients and their variations within the plot itself. So a quick introduction there to displacement distance diagrams for thrusts. They're really useful tools for investigating the geometry of thrust faults and the mechanical behaviour of their wall rocks.